talk, uh, I want to remind everybody that the Wyndham World Affairs Council has been around for 62 years at this point as a forum for discussing world affairs. We're the smallest member and one of the more active members of the National World Affairs Councils of America. It's a you know, broad organization with over 90 national <coughs> chapters, and I believe we are still the smallest, um, but I I'm I'm, can't uh, be certain about that. And the World Affairs Councils of America are an independent, nonpartisan organization dedicated to engaging the public and leading global voices uh, to better understand the world, America's international role, and the policy choices that impact our daily lives and our future. It's really important to us to keep these events uh, free and open to the public. And for that reason, we are dependent entirely on the support of community members like you. Um, if this is your first event, or if you've been to many events, we encourage you uh, to consider joining as a member. Get to know all of us you know, very fascinating board members. Uh, we've got Tamara, our chair here. Lissa is around somewhere back there. Um, we have Jim and uh, Paul, and is anybody else here? Susan, of course, our administrator who makes all these things happen. Um, so the student memberships are free. Individuals are $35 a year. Family memberships are 50 a year. And lifetime memberships are $500. Uh, you can join on the website or come talk with a board member at any point in time. Uh, a perk of membership is inclusion in our monthly Members and Friends Salon, which are lively conversations around often something very topical or going on like in the news right now. Um, you know, sometimes we put together some readings and we come together and discuss them. These are after our monthly board, member, uh, monthly board meetings on the fourth Wednesday of every month. There's refreshments and it's all pretty fun. Um, your support also helps our youth outreach programs. One of the things uh, we're very proud of that we've been doing recently is Peace Jam uh, at the Brattleboro High School. It was launched in September of 2022 with fellow board member Jody Williams, who is herself a Nobel Peace Laureate. And uh, in terms of upcoming events, the next thing we have scheduled is actually next Wednesday. So Wednesday the 25th, and it is a salon dedicated to the topic of thinking globally, acting locally. And the featured discussants will be Sarah Gagnon, Kim Friedman, and Stephen Dotson, who is Brattleboro's sustainability coordinator. So that should be a really interesting conversation. It starts at 6 p.m right here. And I will introduce uh, Sarah Newland, who is Assistant Professor of Government at Smith College. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her research is on local governance in mainland China and Taiwan, and on subnational diplomacy between the US, China, and Taiwan. Her work has been published in Governance, Pacific Review, China Quarterly, and the Journal of Political Science Education. She is a fellow in the Public Intellectuals Program <coughs> with the National Committee on US-China Relations, and a member of the US-Taiwan Next Generation Working Group. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Sarah Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. I would not have come to hear me give a talk tonight in this weather, so I appreciate that you all showed up. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit today about the relationship between the US and China now and sort of how we got here over the course of the last several decades. And a question that I'm often asked is whether we're in a new Cold War. I don't think I have a really definitive answer to that question, but I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of arguments on both sides, reasons why we're in something that kind of looks like the Cold War, but kind of not. 
So to give you a sense of the sort of long scale of um, the, the relationship between the US and China over the course of the 20th and 21st century, I think we had a really dramatic move um, in this relationship from the end of the 1960s until just, just a couple years later. There are some fantastic Chinese propaganda posters from the Cultural Revolution that you can look at if you Google them. There are, some of them are, are kind of hilarious. Um, but this one, I think, is telling of the messaging that the Chinese government was putting forward about the US. So this says in Chinese, peoples of the, of the whole world unite to overthrow American imperialism. You see people raising their little red book, um, sort of showing their allegiance to Mao Zedong, um, and this very strong sort of anti-American messaging. Two years later, we have Richard and Pat Nixon walking on the, on the Great Wall of China, um, talking about how important relations between the US and China were going to be. Um, and this, of course, was the start of a process that took about a decade of the normalization of US-China relations, where um, the US uh, um, came in 1979 to recognize the People's Republic of China as the legitimate government of China. So this is a pretty dramatic turnaround in the course of just three years. And I think it's important to understand that this turnaround really was the product of the Cold War context in a couple of ways. Um, so on the Chinese side, uh, China was in a moment of real chaos domestically. It was in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, leaders were being purged and sent to work in tractor factories. Um, people were being tortured for their class backgrounds, their political beliefs, and China had really moved in a quite isolationist direction internationally. A lot of its diplomats had been recalled or were deeply fearful that they would get in trouble if they did something like speak a foreign language, which could show them to be too westernized or too bourgeois. Um, so despite that, the Chinese government had become increasingly anxious about the Soviet Union and about the possibility, first of all, that the Soviet Union might invade its so-called communist allies, um, especially in the wake of the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia. And there were real reasons why the Chinese government was quite worried um, that the Soviet Union posed a greater threat to China than the US did. And so the sort of shifting, although Mao was really, you know, sort of publicly giving these very anti-US statements still, the thinking quietly began to shift that perhaps the greater enemy was the Soviet Union and not the US, and that China should perhaps be open to some kind of engagement with the US. On the US side, there also was a sort of shift in thinking. Um, that was most clearly represented, I think, by Nixon and the way that he began to move away from the positions that his party um, had held. So Nixon wrote this very uh, um, sort of widely read article in the magazine Foreign Affairs. This was sort of seen as a, as a campaign statement. Um, this was when he was running for president. And he argued that we simply cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations there to nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. There is no place on this small planet for a billion of its potentially most able people to live in angry isolation. The world cannot be safe until China changes, thus our aim to the extent that we can influence events should be to induce change. The way to do this is to persuade China that it must change, that it cannot satisfy its imperial ambitions, and that its own national interest requires a turning away from foreign adventuring, and a turning inward toward the solution of its own domestic problems. So Nixon was really um, sort of trying to think about uh, Asia after the Vietnam War, right? What that was gonna look like. And he recognized China was this enormous country. It eventually was probably going to be a powerful country in the world. And so the, um, the sort of view that had dominated, especially the Republican foreign policy establishment, which was the idea that China could be isolated, he was beginning to recognize that probably, like it or not, China was not going to stay this sort of isolated force in the world, and that perhaps it would be better for the US to engage with China and to try to shape the direction that it took as it became more powerful, rather than to just treat it as um, an enemy. And the U, for the US also, I think there was this kind of the enemy of the enemy of my enemy is my friend recognition that 
um, the, the Soviet Union at this point was seen as a greater threat to the US than China was. And so um, Nixon and some of his advisors wanted to capitalize on the Sino-Soviet split, the fact that the, um, the Chinese government and uh, the Soviet government really were not, um, not playing nicely together after about 1960. He wanted to capitalize on that and try to sort of drive a wedge in the communist bloc by beginning to open up the relationship with China. One of the things that I think is really interesting about this article is that the logic that Nixon is using here then became the, basically the same logic that was echoed by president after president um, really across both political parties for decades to come. So the idea that the US could try to influence the direction that China took as it became wealthier and more powerful in the world, and that engaging with China rather than trying to isolate it was the best way to influence the path that China took. Those are claims that we then see over and over again from a, a political leaders subsequently. So one example of this was um, the sort of language around China entering the, w, uh, the World Trade Organization in 2001, um, where Bill Clinton, who was um, a, a you know, pretty strong proponent of kind of making this happen, of enabling China to join the WTO, argued that by being brought into this international economic community, the US would be better able to shape China's behavior economically and politically, and also that sort of economic engagement with market economies would lead to um, an embrace of liberal values and democracy in China. So there was this view that once people had kind of economic freedom, once they were engaging more with people from around the world economically, that they would be more exposed to democratic ideas, that it would be harder for Chinese politicians to repress those ideas, and that eventually China would move in a more liberal democratic direction and would begin to look more like the US both politically and economically. So at that point, I think Bill Clinton was confident that uh, putting China in a position to prosper from a sort of system of international trade and economic exchange would be mutually beneficial. Um, that this is something that would help China, but ultimately would also help the US and the kind of world order that the US wants to exist in. Um, and that is a claim that I think we still see if we kind of fast, you know, fast forward to the, um, the Obama administration, um, we see that same kind of logic playing out there as well. So um, I love this video clip. I think it's amazing. Uh, President Joe Biden, then Vice President Joe Biden, speaking at Sichuan University in 2011. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to play you a little bit of a clip. Before this clip, Joe Biden says, you know, actually the most important person on this trip is not me, it's my granddaughter, because she's been studying Mandarin for five years in school, and I brought her along on this trip, and um, I'm really just here kind of as her assistant. But listen to the language that Biden uses when he talks about his experience with China and his perceptions of what China's rise might mean. My first introduction here in Sichuan that would, uh, that would begin transforming a largely agrarian society into an engine of global economic growth and help lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty was seemed to me clear at the time. That first visit came amid a debate in the United States of America, similar to the one that exists today, about how to view China's emergence. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. I believed in 1979 and said so, and I believe now that a rising China is a positive development, not only for the people of China, but for the United States and the world as a whole. A rising China will fuel economic growth and prosperity, and it will bring to the fore a new partner with whom we can meet global challenges together. When President Obama and I took office in January of 2009, we made our relationship with China a top priority. We were determined to set it on a stable and sustainable course that would benefit the citizens of both our countries. Our presidents, our presidents have met nine times since then, including very successful state visits in Beijing and Washington. 
and have spoken numerous times by telephone. Direct discussions between senior policymakers and the personal ties that result from such discussions, in my view, over the last 35 years of conducting foreign policy, are the keys to building cooperation. They're built on understanding. They allow us to better understand each other and allow us to define our interest in ways that are clear. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it there. So I think there are a couple things to note about this speech. So the first is this sense of mutual benefit, the idea that a strong China is not a threat to the US, but is actually good for the US because China can be a partner with which the US can sort of address global challenges. The second is this notion of the value of communication between Chinese and US policymakers. And you know, Biden's account, I think, is accurate that there was tons of high and medium level contact between Chinese officials and officials in the Obama administration. And so one thing that I think is really interesting here is just the continuity right, across both Republican and Democratic administrations and across different periods in time. We have this sense that engagement with China is going to be mutually beneficial, um, that China can be shaped in some sense, right? that Chinese behavior can be shaped to uh, fit American interests in some ways, or that China might become more democratic or more liberal over time as a result of that engagement. Um, and also this sense of the value of personal engagement between Chinese and U.S. leaders. So all of this, I think... My first was, introduction... Sorry, stop talking, Joe. Okay. <laughs> all of this, I think, was, um, was really, you know, taken for granted as the sort of normal in American politics from the, the end of the 1970s, in some ways, from the, the beginning of that moment of normalization of the U.S.-China relationship, um, through the Obama administration. And then there was this really dramatic shift. And so to give you a sense of just how dramatic the shift is, there are a lot of quotes I could have pulled up, but I thought this was a good one. Um, so this was Joe Biden just a couple months ago. Uh -oh. Is this still working? Maybe we don't need this. You don't think you need the mic? Because we're wondering about the buzzing. Okay. Let's see, can people hear this? Can I, is that good? Can people hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so August 2023, I don't have video of this because it was at a private fundraiser and it was leaked. So Biden <laughs> said, China is in trouble, they have got some problems. That's not good because when bad folks have problems, they do bad things. Um, and so he, I think, was referring to some of China's economic woes right now. Unemployment is quite high, young people are having trouble finding a job. Um, but this idea that like the Chinese leaders are bad people is something that you certainly did not see in the Joe Biden of 2011 when he was talking about like how many times he had had dinner with Chinese leaders. So I want us to think a little bit about how we got to this dramatic change. And one of the things that I think is quite interesting about it is a lot of the personnel are the same. The people who are advising Biden on China policy are many of the same people who are advising Obama on China policy. And so it's not that the people who are making the policies are different, right? Something about the context or their thinking on China is different. Um, so often people point to the 2016 election as an important turning point, especially on the Republican side, although not exclusively on the Republican side. There was a lot of discussion of China um, and obviously Donald Trump was a big piece of this, right? He was constantly referring to China and its threat to the US in some of his um, debate performances, campaign appearances, um, and he was so central to the way that the media were sort of telling the story of 2016 that um, that wound up being a real focus. Um, subsequently, there have been pretty dramatic changes in policy on both sides. Uh, so after Trump was elected, he put in place some quite restrictive new visa policies that make it very, very difficult for Chinese students to come to American universities, especially in science and technology fields. Those visa restrictions have not been lifted under President Biden, so it remains very difficult for Chinese students to come here. And there's a clear cost to American science as a result of this. There's some very compelling evidence that shows that 
American science is less innovative, there are fewer patent applications, things like that, because Chinese graduate students were an essential part of the sort of infrastructure of science labs, a lot of researchers can't do their research now in the face of some of these restrictions. There also were some pretty dramatic increases in anti-Asian violence, uh, which can be traced fairly directly to some of the anti-Asian language that Trump and other politicians were using, um, particularly after the outbreak of COVID-19, um, the kind of racialized language that Trump was using then wound up being mimicked and amplified by far-right media, um, by lots of individuals. And so you can see really across major cities in the US, there are these dramatic spikes in violent attacks on Asians. So a lot of people were really sort of hopeful that regardless of what direction you think US policy toward China should take, that some of these things um, might have a little bit of a reset under, under Biden, right? That we might go back to a bit of the era, um, the sort of old engagement era. But in fact, that really hasn't happened. And so one way to do this, I, I should say that I would be interested to see this data updated because this is before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and so I'm curious about how that might have shifted things. Um, but one of the things that was really clear is that Americans have come to view China as a primary threat to the United States. And so if you follow the sort of green line here, that's the percentage of people who say, in, in answer to the question, what one country anywhere in the world do you consider to be the United States' greatest enemy today? This is the percentage saying China. So in 2001, that percentage was 14. And by 2021, that percentage was 45. So almost half of the people who were polled, this is a Gallup poll, a very large nationally representative poll. Um, almost half of the people who were polled identified China as the, the number one foreign threat to the US. And this is something that really transcends political party. There are some differences, but across the political spectrum, attitudes on China have dramatically changed. They've changed among politicians, but they also have changed among ordinary citizens, as this poll suggests. So I want to think a little bit about why that might be, why we see this change from an attitude of thinking that the US and China could cooperate, that um, China could be an ally of the US, or at least um, a sort of you know, maybe partner with some reservations or hesitations in the world uh, to this sense that China is a kind of evil place run by bad people um, that is fundamentally threatening to the US. And I think there have been real political changes on both the US side and the Chinese side that help to explain why we're now in this moment of deep mutual suspicion. Um, so on the Chinese side, I think it is really important to highlight the uh, ascension to power of Xi Jinping. Uh, he is very different than the Chinese leaders that preceded him. Um, he is really deeply dictatorial. Uh, China has become a much more repressive place across nearly every area of society since he became the leader in 2012. Um, civil society organizations have been essentially shuttered the already pretty limited room for independent media or media reporting has been dramatically decreased. Um, people are being thrown in jail for things that would have been sort of quietly excused um, or at least uh, treated with a lower level of repression now. They're being treated much more harshly. This is a different leader. Um, there are a number of laws that have been passed under Xi Jinping's leadership that directly target foreigners for doing things like doing research in China. It's much easier now to be arrested and thrown in jail for a violation of a Chinese research law than it was 10 years ago. Um, in lots of other ways, I think he has sort of shrunk the space for international collaboration, for a free exchange of ideas, um, whether that is between academics, between people in civil society groups, or between officials even. I think many officials there are quite afraid of sort of doing something that's a misstep and winding up with their, um, their career in shambles, in shambles or perhaps with themselves um, purged or in jail. A second change, and this is not unrelated to what I just said, is that there have been a set of increasingly repressive policies in China that have been on very public view and have really gotten a lot of attention 
from the US public and from political elites. The crackdown on the 2019 pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong um, is one good example. Those were you know, front page news of the New York Times. Um, for, for months, people were ve very aware of them. Uh, those protests have been really brutally cracked down on. Many, many, many of the people who are involved in the pro-democracy protests are in jail or have had to flee abroad. Um, you know, middle schoolers who are involved in the protests have been thrown in jail. Uh, peaceful protesters were tear gassed. I mean, it was a really, really bloody crackdown, brutal crackdown that has continued to go on through the legal system and through the courts. The re-education camps in Xinjiang, in which um, the numbers vary, but many people think upwards of a million uh, Uyghur Muslims have been put in so-called patriotic education camps in northwestern China. This is a new development under Xi Jinping. Increasing military aggression toward Taiwan um, with uh, uh, military PLA planes flying into Taiwan's um, air defense identification zone now more days than not. That's, this is also a new development. It's not that these things never happened before, but the frequency and regularity of them, the degree of repression across a wide array of areas is really something that's quite new in the last 10 years. China's rapid military modernization, I think, has not come as a surprise to people, but has made people rethink the implications of a strong and powerful China, right? Talking about how great a strong and powerful China is for the US was different in 2011 when China's military was nowhere near parity with the US. Now China's military is much more modernized than it was 10 years ago. And so the costs um, of you know, potentially having a sort of military equal, uh, it seems like a different game now than it did a, a decade ago. And then finally, I think um, economic changes in China that have sort of centralized government power um, really have shrunk the role for foreign business in China. Um, and recently actually have, have really increased the <coughs> risks to foreign business people who are doing business in China. So there were some high profile um, interrogations of consultants for companies like McKinsey in China a couple of months ago. That's something that was really unheard of, I think, before a few years ago. And so this sense that there was a kind of world of opportunity, economic opportunity in China for Americans um, who could go and make money there and you know, benefit from the exchange, a lot of people here have really soured on that because now those economic opportunities either don't exist or they feel very risky, right? You can try, but you might not make any money. The government might um, enable firms to steal your intellectual property or you might be arrested on trumped up charges of sort of stealing someone's data under a Chinese law. And then I think the final piece, and we're still sort of trying to figure out what the long-term consequences of this will be, are that China implemented very, very strict border restrictions during COVID. So for essentially, for three years, there was essentially no person-to-person -person contact between the US and China. Um, people really couldn't get in unless they had a Chinese passport, with very limited exceptions. Um, there used to be uh, over 10,000 American students who were studying in China at any given time. That number was down to about 300 a year and a half ago. So just the scale of exchange of opportunities for people to actually get to know people from the other country really dramatically uh, shrank and have started to open back up, but um, are still much more limited than they were before the pandemic. So on the US side, I think there also has been a set of sort of political and economic changes mm -hmm. that mean that the interest in engagement with China has really declined. So first of all, on both the left and the right of the American political spectrum, I think we've seen a a decline in interest in free trade, right? A lot of the people who were advocates of engagement with China thought that free trade between our countries would be mutually beneficial. Um, but Trump began to really kind of amplify the voices of people who felt like they had lost out as a result of that and who felt like the kinds of jobs that they want to have had moved abroad as a result of globalization. And we also had some voices on the progressive left, so Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, drawing attention to some of the human costs of free trade, right? Things like 
um, the ways in which uh, labor rights are not respected, for instance, by some of the US's partners, um, and the ways in which uh, the sort of quality of jobs that are provided here might be affected by, negatively affected um, by international trade. And so I think the, the sort of consensus view across both the, the Democratic and Republican parties that free trade was a good thing, that really began to shift as a result of some of these new voices coming into politics. Trump also really changed the conversation. As I said, he kind of brought attention to a particular economic message, but he also gave voice to a kind of racism and xenophobia um, that he expressed most vocally through kind of anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, and, you know, that was something that I think maybe people were thinking it before, but it wasn't so publicly part of the, of the um, sort of public the, uh, discourse before Trump um, became a candidate. And then it's a little bit hard to sort of separate out what the cause and what the effect is, but public opinion has turned strongly anti-China. And so public officials uh, respond to that, right? If they see that their constituents are very anti-China, then they're less likely to support engagement with China. Citizens also see politicians saying anti-China things and hear that and respond to it. And so there's a little, becomes a little bit of a kind of feedback loop. Um, and now some competition between officials over who can be the most hawkish and vociferously anti-China. So where are we today? I think, you know, this is kind of um, the, I, I could have stopped this message in 2021 and it would have still been accurate. And so one thing that I think is important to think about is now China is beginning to open back up. People can go there. As I said, a lot of the exchanges have not fully opened up. There are still limitations on both sides preventing sort of person to person exchanges. Uh, the sort of politicians reaching out to each other and meeting with each other, it's quite tentative. Um, but there, there are some more opportunities for exchange. And yet, I think we're not going to go back to the sort of decades of just pro-engagement politics as normal. One thing that I think we're really seeing now are kind of diverging impulses um, uh, between different kinds of politicians and between different kinds of states. So last week, Chuck Schumer was in Shanghai. He met with the Shanghai Party Secretary, Chen Zining. Um, and so there are you know, some politicians who I think are really eager to return to some kind of engagement with China, to start to open up economic opportunities in China, to open up some of those um, educational exchanges and things like that. Then you have people like Ron DeSantis, who loves giving speeches in front of a Stop CCP Influence placard. I could have given you 20 different photos of him in front of a Stop CCP Influence placard. Um, he talks about China all the time. I think any hawkish policy that he can embrace, he will embrace. So uh, Florida has done a variety of things to try to sort of limit Chinese presence in the state. Um, there's a land ban that essentially makes it impossible for Chinese citizens to buy a house or land in a large percentage of Florida, passed the state legislature and was signed um, by Ron DeSantis a few months ago. It's being challenged by the ACLU, but it's currently still in place. There have been other uh, laws that have passed that have tried to um, sort of diminish the, uh, the, the possibilities for foreign funding of universities targeting a specific set of countries, including um, including China. Uh, his attorney general also has pursued a number of kind of anti-China um, policies. She tried to make it possible to sue the Chinese Communist Party for the economic costs of COVID. This was an effort by about 15 state attorney generals um, wanted to sue the CCP. Um, and so we have this sort of bifurcated system where there are some people who really do, I think, want to return to a version of engagement and other people who I think feel like China is this existential threat to the United States. So where does that leave us? Are we in a new Cold War? And as I said at the beginning, I, I have a waffly answer to this, um, a kind of yes and no answer. Um, so I think there are a couple of ways in which this moment is reminiscent of Cold War version 1.0. Um, one is that we do see a little bit of some efforts by the U.S. and China to engage in a kind of ideological competition and create blocks of countries that will um, 
ally with their vision of the world. So just this week, a number of leaders were in Beijing to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this was, I would say, mostly a collection of dictators, not entirely. Um, it's Indonesia's president who is elected. Um, but you can see we have Putin standing next to Xi Jinping. Um, these are certainly a collection of countries, uh, mostly Global South countries, I would say, who um, in general, I think, are suspicious of US power in the world, um, take the idea of sort of non-interference in countries' domestic affairs seriously, at least as a, a talking point. Um, uh, you know, so they're, that often is a way of talking about why they don't think that the US or the United Nations or the advanced industrial economies have a right to weigh in on what's going on within their own borders. And so for Xi Jinping, I think this kind of event is a way to try to bring together countries that he thinks share his vision of the world and will support China as um, a leader of that kind of vision of the world. On the flip side, you have Joe Biden putting together, now I think there have been three summits for democracy. These have been meetings of countries that are unsurprisingly democratic countries. Um, and so similarly, you know, this is a, a, um, a sort of loose grouping at this point, but it's organized around an ideology, right? You don't get invited to this unless, uh, you know, the U.S. deems that you are a democracy. And so I do think that there is a, a bit of this sort of separation into blocks. What defines each block is different, right? It's not about communism anymore, I would argue, not for China or really for anyone in this grouping. China is pretty much... Uh, you know, it's, it has some communist elements, but many other capitalist ones. Um, and there are lots of countries in this, in this block on the left that, you know, don't have any interest in, in communism or claim to be communist countries. Um, but there is a little bit of a sort of ideological alignment of these two blocks. I think a second way in which this is reminiscent of the Cold War has to do with the kind of a fear of the other that is trickling down into American politics at the local level. Uh, so some of my research is on um, state level policy making toward China and one of the things that's been happening a lot in the last couple of years are these um, bills that are anti-China bills at the local level. Um, this was a, a protest against these uh, the Chinese uh, land ban bill in Florida that I mentioned before but also major protests over potential sales of land to, Chinese, to companies with links to China. So there's been a major controversy in Michigan um, over the sale of some land to an EV battery company called Goshen. Um, Goshen is a US subsidiary of a Chinese company. Um, and I think there's real genuine fear among people who are in this pretty rural area in Michigan um, that the Communist Party is moving in next door and is going to like take over their section of rural Michigan. Um, and you know, people have tried to make the case this is a poor area of Michigan. It would bring a fair amount of uh, jobs and money into the area. Um, but it seems like the sort of fear of communism and fear of Chinese communist influence is is pretty deeply felt um, in a way that I think to some people feels quite reminiscent of the Cold War. So on the whole, though, I do not think that this is Cold War version 2.0. And the reason for that is just that the US and China are so deeply intertwined as a result of those decades of engagement um, that we're never going to separate, right? There's never going to be this possibility of these sort of rigidly divided blocks that have very little economic contact with each other. Um, my favorite formulation of this was someone who said, you know, during the Cold War, the first original Cold War, um, American farmers were not buying tractors from the Soviet Union. And I think that's the right way to think about this, right? The US buys a ton of stuff from China. China buys a ton of stuff from us. Um, the, the sort of what would be required to disentangle our economies is, is just, it's essentially impossible. And so although politicians sometimes talk about decoupling, and there certainly have been policy efforts to try to make the US less dependent on the Chinese economy, 
Um, and on the Chinese side, there have been efforts to you know, make China less dependent on things like US innovation. There are real limits to the degree to which those can progress. I think it, we're inevitably sort of interconnected. Uh, things like climate change are another way in which fundamentally our two countries are just, just inextricably linked together, right? That's a problem that neither country can address fully on its own for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I think that sense of deep interconnection between the two places can be a stabilizing force, right? It can mean that we both have interests in making sure that relations, uh, even if they're bad, they, they don't get worse than a certain point. Um, but also these interconnections can be a source of our frictions, right? They can be some of the reasons why there are so many frictions between the US and China have to do with the economic interconnections between the two places and the sense on, on the part of many people that the US has been cheated by um, those interconnections. And so I guess my answer ultimately is I don't think the relationship is necessarily going to get easier. And I think a period of sustained sort of conflict um, is, is likely to persist for quite a long time. But I also don't think that those dynamics are gonna become these sort of uh, uh, two blocks frozen, uh, deeply separated from each other in the same way that we saw in the Cold War. Um, so I am gonna end there. Thank you very much for your attention and I would love to hear questions and comments. I didn't hear you say much about Taiwan. Isn't Taiwan a real sticking point for our relationship? Yeah, so, um, so the US and China have disagreed about Taiwan since the normalization of, of the US-China relationship, um, and even before then, actually. Um, and so I do think that our views on Taiwan and the status of Taiwan are fundamentally different from each other. Um, but that has been the case through periods, through good times in the U.S.-China relationship and bad times in the U.S.-China relationship. Um, and, you know, I think um, it, the, the fact that the Taiwan issue has become such a, such a large like, point of contention right now is in part a result of the fact that we're not really talking about anything else, right? It used to be that Chinese policymakers could, you know, call the State Department and say, we're mad about your Taiwan policy, but then they were also talking to 20 other people and 20 other agencies about lots of other things that weren't so contentious. And right now, a lot of those other less contentious topics, there's just no communication on them between the US and China. And so the only things that are sort of left are the things that are fundamental points of disagreement. Um, I think the other thing that I would say, I, some, a lot of my research is on, on Taiwan, and so this is something that I, I think about quite a lot. Um, I think it's really important to not lose sight of the fact that Taiwanese people have their own perspective on this issue, right? And, and we often, Taiwan often gets talked about as like a problem or a sticking point in the US-China relationship. Um, but, you know, People in Taiwan have their own view of how things, what their role in the world should be. And they're not happy with the fact that they're getting pulled into an international conflict either, right? And so I think it's important just to sort of, yeah, think about like, not, not just sort of think about it as a problem in the US-Taiwan relationship, but also think about what Taiwanese people actually want for their, themselves, the 24 million people who live there, um, what they see as the best solution for keeping themselves safe in a pretty dangerous corner of the world, given that they have a neighbor that doesn't want them to exist. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for this. It was really, really clear and really interesting. Uh, I'm curious. You mentioned uh, climate change a minute ago, and I'm wondering what is China doing about climate change? Are there any uh, communications open between the United States or the UN and China? I seem to think that a lot of their industry is run off coal, but that could be incorrect. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a really complicated question, and I, I, I am not an expert on Chinese climate policy, so you know more than I, do. I, I, will, I will give a partial answer, 
um, and then encourage you to look at um, uh, work by people like Angel Xu, um, Jeremy Wallace is working on Chinese climate policy. There's some really, really eminent scholars who are working on some of this. Um, so I think there's a, like a policy piece and a technological piece. So technologically, China produces a huge share of um, things like the uh, solar panels that we need, right, and like batteries, EV batteries. Um, there, there are a lot of ways in which I think for the U.S. to make a kind of transition to, to clean energy, we have to do that in partnership with China in some way, right? Setting aside what that partnership looks like, uh, China just is the place with the companies that are manufacturing the wind turbines, the solar panels, the batteries. Um, and that's really complicated because Part of the reason for that has to do with Chinese government policies that subsidize those industries mm -hmm. and gave them, according to you know, a lot of uh, firms in the US and elsewhere, gave them an unfair advantage, right? But now ultimately they are the ones that have and create that, those technologies. Um, and so this is sort of what's at stake in some of these local conflicts over things like the Goshen plant. Um, where you know people who are advocating for those investments are saying the U.S. is not going to meet any of its green energy goals, right? Whether it's state goals or national goals, it's not going to meet those if we don't get batteries from somewhere. And wouldn't we rather produce those batteries here than have them produced in China and buy them from China, right? Either way, China is going to be involved in the process. Whether it's Chinese companies that are you know have a local subsidiary and are producing them here or Chinese companies that produce them in China and we buy the batteries from them and then we use them here. Um, and so technologically, I think China is inevitably going to be a part of the equation around how fast we can convert to those technologies, who winds up getting them, at what price we get them, um, because it is the one that has the firms that are producing those things. In terms of policy, um, there are some ambitious policy goals in China uh, that are, you know, sort of setting climate targets. I think, um, you know, there are a lot of people who would like China to move faster than it is committing um, to move in terms of some of uh, hitting some of those targets. There's been some interesting sort of discussions around local competition, like encouraging localities to sort of compete against each other um, to make faster progress. But yeah, it's absolutely true that you know, as, as China has decommissioned some of its coal plants within its own borders, it also is opening coal plants in other countries, um, in sort of you know, countries that are uh, nominally aid recipient countries. And so there's still a big coal economy that's tied to China. Um, and you know, ultimately, I think probably both countries need to do a lot more in terms of being more aggressive um, in order to come anywhere close to um, meeting the sort of targets that scientists say we need to meet to, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Um, and there's a little bit of a sort of blame game where Chinese officials say, well, the U.S. caused a lot of the problem, why should we pay the price? And people say, well, if you don't pay the price, like, we're all going to die, right? So it's a little bit of a, um, I don't know, like a chicken and egg problem to solve. But yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's so complicated. So that's, I think, all I can tell you for now. But yeah. Yes. So let's go back to Taiwan. Yeah. You were saying an important thing is what do the Taiwanese, the 24 or 29 million yeah. people, think? What do they think? What do they want? Yeah. Do they want to? They want to use our umbrella. They don't want our umbrella. They want to. Yeah. Go ahead and become part of mainland China officially. Or? So they definitely do not want to become part of mainland China. That is one thing that is very, very, very clear from the polling. There at this point are. I think it's under 10% of the Taiwanese population consider themselves Chinese. A very small percentage of people want to be part of China. Um, very few people wanted to consider wanted to be part of China before 2019. But then, when um, China sort of took, you know, violated Hong Kong, this promise to Hong Kong of one country, two systems, went in, jailed democracy activists, tear gassed middle schoolers in the streets. Uh, Taiwan was watching that, and that one country, two systems formulation of sort of having your own system of government but being part of China, that was what was promised to Taiwan as the way that Taiwan would enter China. 
and would become a part of China. And so people in Taiwan watched that very carefully and said, we absolutely do not want what has happened in Hong Kong. So any will that existed to become part of China um, has really disappeared in Taiwan. Um, that said, people in Taiwan are very pragmatic. They understand that they live with an existential threat next door. And they know that if they were to declare independence, China would invade, because um, China has been very clear about that. And so what people in Taiwan say they want is what has been the status quo for a long time, right? They want to be essentially allowed to act like an independent country in the world, allowed to live their own lives um, without, uh, without the Chinese government invading, right? Without, um, and so, you know, I think that they, um, their hope is just that that would continue. And that's pretty clear, you know, it's, it's a vibrant democracy, there's a lot of disagreements, so there's people across a political spectrum, but it's pretty clear that that's where the majority of opinion lies, um, that people are, are willing to accept not being called an independent country um, if they are allowed to just kind of live, live the lives that they wanna live, um, live under a democratic system that they know they wouldn't have if Taiwan were part of China. Um, I think that the last piece of that is that you know, a, a war, an invasion of Taiwan would be incredibly catastrophic for everyone involved. It would be an incredibly brutal war. Um, Taiwan would suffer a lot, but so would China. There would be a ton of casualties. And if the U.S., so would, so would the U.S. And so I think they have a, a profound understanding. Obviously, they're the ones who would suffer most. Um, that that is really something that they intensely want to avoid. Is that something that China with their demographics and things willing to let go forward? I mean, because their population is aging and declining, and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is that something they're willing to accept, that this, this situation will go forward? Or are they going to decide, if we're going to do it, we have to do it pretty soon? So I think they've been willing to accept that for a long time. And I hope that they will be willing to continue to accept that. I think that Chinese leaders are not crazy, they're not irrational, and I think they recognize the huge costs that would be involved. Um, and, you know, China is in a weak position right now in many ways. I mean, as you said, I think the, the population is beginning um, to age rapidly. The Chinese economy is in really dire straits. I mentioned before, um, unemployment is quite high. It's a lot of dissatisfaction. The risk of invading another country and then having people see, you know, 18-year-olds come home in body bags, um, that's a big risk, right? And, and you know, it's, it, this is not a war that would be won in an instant, most likely. Um, and I think the Ukraine example is something that Chinese leaders have been watching very closely, you know? So the last thing they want is a Ukraine situation of a protracted war. Um, and so, I don't know how long they're gonna wait, um, but I do think that there's, um, there's no reason for them to rush into an invasion that I think would be very, very, very costly. Um, and so some, you know, there have been some commentators who really make it sound like there's gonna be an invasion tomorrow. Um, and I think it's important to sort of think carefully about those. I, I'm not always very convinced by them. I think there's, at this point, more reasons for patience on the part of the Chinese regime than there are reasons for a sort of rash decision um, to risk a, a catastrophic war. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, uh, first, the comment sticking with Taiwan again. I, I read an interesting but actually frightening article in the Wall Street Journal on semiconductor production. And uh, the numbers that were cited in this study, 25% of the world's semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan. 92% of the advanced yep. semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan. Yeah. So that could be one incentive. I think she hasn't let the Shanghai ship go from years ago. Uh, what is your sense of the strength of President Ng Wen, how she's doing? I mean, I, I read a yeah. little on her. It's hard to find a whole lot, but she seems like she's got a pretty, pretty strong stance. Yeah, so President Tsai um, is at the end of her, her second term, um, so she will be term limited out in January. Um, I think most people regard her as having been a very successful president. Um, 
in a very difficult time, right? So I think she has been very moderate and very careful not to antagonize the Chinese government. Um, and so, uh, and, and she, she leads a party that was traditionally a, a, like a pro-independence party and there still are some voters within her party who really would like Taiwan to declare independence. Is, is it called the Democratic What? Progressive? Democratic Progressive, Progressive Party, Party. yeah. Um, and so, you know, she, I think, has had to walk this tightrope of uh, sort of needing to satisfy those voters by standing up for Taiwan and saying, you know, Taiwan is like a country in the world, right? We are a place that has our own history and our own culture and our own politics that we should be proud of, but also not wanting to suggest that Taiwan is going to declare independence tomorrow because then the Chinese government might um, retaliate with it uh, by invading. And so, you know, I think that walking that line is something that she has done very, very well. The big question right now is Taiwan's election is January 13th, um, and we don't know what the next president will be like, right? At this point, it, it is looking like it'll be uh, her current vice president, mostly because the other party can't agree on a nominee. So there's three, <laughs> essentially three people running um, for one, you know, set of 40% of the voters and they're tearing each other apart. Um, that could change. But, you know, even her, her vice president, um, he, as a, as a young man, he was quite strongly pro-independence. Um, his statements subsequently have been, you know, in recent months, certainly since he um, sort of moved into this high office, he, he has been very moderate and has said he will continue her policies. Um, I don't think Beijing believes that, right? I think they, they believe that he's a sort of secret independence activist and are worried um, about what direction he might take Taiwan in. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be watching Taiwan politics. And um, I think there's, even for people who watch it really closely, uh, there are a lot of questions about how whoever is president, whoever is elected president in 2024, how they're going to govern. Yeah. Um, beyond the um, political, economic, military differences and um, you know, relations of the U.S. and China, is, do you think talking about like differing cultural values is worthwhile to speak to for a little bit? Maybe there's some incompatibility there and difficulty in understanding, or maybe not. So, I mean, I tend to not give very much weight to kind of cultural explanations because both China and the U.S. are enormous and internally really diverse, you know, and and so I think, I, I mean, I don't know, like there are some ways in which places have an innate culture, but there are lots of ways in which culture is very sort of mutable and, um, and so I, I don't tend to I don't tend to buy in too much to the idea that there's like an innate cultural difference between the two places that makes it hard for us to cooperate. And you know, I think some some examples of that are a place like Japan, right, which shares many cultural elements with China um, in terms of you know sort of traditional you know traditions and and some linguistic similarities and some religious overlap and things like that. Um, and Japan's been a very close U.S. ally since World War II, right? And similarly, you know, Taiwan, um, to, to go back to the Taiwan example, um, you know, 30 years ago, people in Taiwan thought of themselves as Chinese, and now they don't think of themselves as Chinese, and they really emphasize that, you know, Taiwan is a product of multiple cultural traditions, um, Chinese influence is probably the most dominant, but Taiwan was a Japanese colony, it was a Dutch colony, um, it has an indigenous population, it's been strongly influenced by the U.S., and those things together, plus Taiwan's sort of path to become a democracy, have given it a really different culture than China. Um, and it's true that like they feel really different, you know, one place, you, you go to the two places, they just feel very different from each other. Um, and that's just in the course of, you know, less than half a century that that sort of cultural shift has, has occurred. So for me, I don't, I think there can be moments of misunderstanding that can be caused by a cultural difference of, you know, you've 
do something that's a faux pas that you don't realize, you inadvertently offend someone by doing something that's rude in their culture that isn't rude in yours. Um, but in terms of our sort of ability in the longer term to work with a particular country, I tend not to believe that culture is, is a real impediment to that. Yeah, I know um, a lot of your work involves um, sort of lower level elected officials, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on political participation in China mm. um, and how the party, the um, you know, the gatherings of the party that, of course, now have given Xi lifetime status. But why that came to be, was, was that just because people were riding high on anti-poverty and all the economic achievements, so they figured, let's, let's keep it going, but now the people might withdraw some of that support. So how does political support and, and political participation play out in terms of um, Chinese power in general? Sure. So there isn't a role for citizens in electing high-level leaders um, in China. So party positions are not elected. There's no role for citizens. Uh, there are village elections. So in the countryside, um, you know, villagers have an opportunity to elect the people who are like in the village council. But that's very low-level policy making. And even that is now very constrained by the party. So the party really rules in China. Every government office has a partner office in the Communist Party, and the real power holder is the, the party office. And so the government does more like implementing things that the party wants. So the short answer is that there is no, it's not about public opinion or you know, citizens feeling positively toward the economy or anything like that, because there's no direct lines of control between the Chinese population and their leaders. Um, the, the party as an institution makes decisions about things like who becomes the top leader, right? And so in, in Xi Jinping's case, there, you know, a, a lot of this is sort of shrouded in secrecy. It, it happens behind the scenes. There's no transparency in the media about it. Um, but Xi Jinping came from a powerful family. His dad was an important um, leader in the Communist Party. Really interesting history. Um, he was he was purged, and so you know, I think Xi Jinping sort of saw the best and the worst in some ways of being in that upper echelon of the elite. Um, very elite upbringing, but then also uh, his sister committed suicide. I mean, it's just a, it's a, a really the, a sad family history in some ways of becoming the victims of the system that his dad kind of helped to create. Um, but I think he was an astute politician and was able to amass the support of a faction of sort of lower level politicians and folks in the upper echelon of the party who wanted to see him become the top leader. And they were very effective at pushing out competition. So instead of like voters voting, often there's sort of competition between different factions within the Communist Party. And there used to be really kind of balanced competition between a couple of different groups. And you would see members of both groups represented in that top set of 12 leaders. And now Xi Jinping's faction is really pretty dominant. So he's managed to use anti-corruption trials to push out a lot of his rivals um, and to use things like adjusting the age of retirement rules to say like, oh, all of a sudden you're too old, you have to leave office, but you get to stay. And you know the people who get to stay have been often his allies. And so he's a very savvy politician and has been able to um, make it so that there really aren't too many challenges, I think, to his power right now. There was this remarkable moment of sort of political theater about a year ago where the former president was escorted out of a major meeting, clearly against his will. And that would not have happened before. I mean, that's no one really knows ultimately why that happened. But that's the kind of thing that Xi Jinping is now able to orchestrate because he has pushed all of the other factions out of any kind of like positions of real power. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, but could you comment on your research maybe a little bit, like what you're doing in terms of lower level officials? So, so most of my, my current research is either about, um, actually at the moment pretty much all of it is about subnational diplomacy between the US and China and the US and Taiwan. So, mm -hmm. 
Um, I look at things like the anti-Chinese land purchase bills and my co-author Kyle Jaros at Notre Dame and I are trying to understand why different states have diverged. So in this moment of US-China tensions overall, some states are still doing a fair amount of kind of cooperation with China. Um, Gavin Newsom, who's the governor of California, is going to China in a couple of days in part to, to um, work on sort of climate cooperation. Um, and then there are other states that are trying to, you know, essentially ban Chinese people from the state. There was a bill in Texas that would have banned Chinese students from the UT system. Um, and so we're trying to understand sort of how those policies are playing out in different places and why different states are starting to look so different from each other. Um, and then on the Taiwan side, I'm really looking at sort of collaboration or engagement between uh, U.S. city and state politicians in Taiwan and trying to understand why there's been more interest at some moments than others. There's been a real increase since 2016 in engagement with Taiwan at the state level in the U.S. Um, the governor of New Jersey was just there. Four governors have been to Taiwan this month. Um, so there's a lot of interest right now, and so we're sort of looking at why why those changes happen over time. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. Just to uh, follow on that. Um, is that are they drivers of U.S. policy? Do you think that the Taiwanese expats, expats are always important drivers of policy here in the U.S. toward their former countries? Um, I don't. I don't think in terms of that kind of subnational engagement. I don't think the Taiwanese expat community is driving it. I think it's more about the combination of business uh, opportunities. So um, in the back, you had mentioned semiconductors. Um, there was an enormous TSMC investment in Arizona. They're building a giant semiconductor fab in Arizona, multi-billion dollar investment. A lot of states saw that and were like, I want that, right? I want that in my state. And so I think part of what's happening is um, as some sort of disengagement between the US economy and the Chinese economy has happened, as laws like the Chips and Science Act have tried to kind of steer US business away from China, um, there's real interest in engaging with Taiwan and especially with Taiwan's semiconductor industry economically. And also I think it's good policy right now. We're in such a sort of anti-China mood. There's a lot of interest in supporting Taiwan as Chinese aggression toward Taiwan has increased. Some politicians are also using it as a way to sort of poke China in the eye, right? So they express their love for Taiwan as a way to show how anti-China they are. And so all those things I think are kind of coming together. Yeah. Yeah. What current information do you have about the uh, Chinese Navy building these platforms in the South China Sea. Yeah. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Please? I'm sorry. The, the question was about the Chinese Navy and the construction of these. Um, it's not just the Navy that's doing it, but they're kind of like air, islands in the shape of airstrips in the South China Sea and um, construction of sort of generally expanding um, the kind of apparatus to support infrastructure to support the Chinese military further out from China's shores. Um, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't have a really detailed answer to that. It's not something that I study. It is certainly something that is cause of grave concern in Southeast Asia. There's a lot of anxiety about it. Um, there's a lot more conflicts between Chinese boats and boats from Southeast Asian countries than there were before. And certainly, like the construction, you can see it in the satellite imagery, right? They're essentially new islands that were built by the Chinese military that weren't there 10 or 15 years ago, um, definitely making the US and also lots of countries in the region really anxious. Um, I don't know more than that in terms of the technical details, but yeah, great, great question. All right, now this might be a little bit off topic, but since we're here talking about world affairs, I'm wondering if you could comment anything on China's expansionist policy, like where they set up 100-year leases for land or resources in Africa, or they're looking to access um, lithium in South America. Yeah. Um, you know, that the relationships, you know, that way with commerce and also with government and these long-term yeah. commitments that are starting to happen in the world. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a big country, right? It's 1.3, almost 1.4, maybe it's over 1.4 billion people at this point. And it's a country that um, you know is moving 
has moved many people into the middle class relative to, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, certainly relative to, say, 1975. Um, and so as a result, you know, China is on a sort of global quest for resources, right? And so whether those are um, oil or whether it's things like minerals that then, you know, need to go into things like batteries or whatever, right? They're, they're um, on a quest for resources. And so certainly there have been a ton of Chinese investments across resource-rich countries. Um, I think, you know, a, a, a related but somewhat separate piece mm -hmm. is the way in which um, the Chinese government under the auspices of the Belt and Road Initiative is building infrastructure across much of the developing world. And a lot of this is being built through, um, they sort of offer loans to a recipient country and then they build an airport, um, a, a rail system, you know, high-speed rail, things like that. Um, many of these deals are, it is now becoming clear, are pretty bad deals for the recipient countries. Mm -hmm. um, there was just an article about a, um, an airport, I'm trying to remember where it was. Um, uh, where? Nepal. Yes, in Nepal, right, an airport that had been um, built by, uh, um, you know, by a Chinese construction company. I was in Indonesia in January and there was something similar, there was a um, high-speed rail. Initially, a Japanese company had gotten the contract. A Chinese company came in and said, we're going to do it cheaper and faster and got the contract instead and then ultimately did it slower and more expensive. I mean, it still hadn't been finished, right? So it was more expensive and slower than the Japanese version would have been. Um, and, you know, so I think these are the kind of things, they're sort of growing pains as China tries to move into a kind of global superpower status. Mm -hmm. It's doing it in a different way than the U.S. did it, and so some of what it's trying to do is to kind of connect the world um, to China through infrastructure construction, through railroads that are going to go all the way through Southeast Asia and up to, you know, to China and across to Beijing and things like that. Um, and you know, it, it has linked a lot of countries to it. There are many countries that now are signatories to the Belt and Road, um, uh, but, you know, it's not always doing it well, and the honeymoon period, I think, is over, right? Where initially countries said, oh, this is a great alternative to borrowing from an international organization, um, and now are realizing that in many cases they kind of got a poor deal. Yeah? Yeah, um, about Belt and Road, uh, you know, once you build a physical asset, <coughs> particularly if you've taken a loan out for it, um, you know, if you can't pay the money back, you still have the physical asset. And that may be what Belt and Road becomes. There are all these things the Chinese have spent money to, to buy, and uh, they're yet to be paid for any of them. Right, yeah, and so, you know, there's, right, so I think there, there are questions about the degree to which this is like an alternative aid model, right, mm -hmm. or, um, but, you know, there have been a number of cases in which um, countries have really felt like, you know, they, they were under pressure to repay some of those loans and they were not going to be able to, to the point of like, real concerns about what would happen if they defaulted on those loans. I do think, you know, the Belt and Road is now 10 years old. That's still relatively young in some ways. And so I, I think it'll be really interesting to watch and see, like, what does China do if these loans are unaffordable, right? What happens to those countries that have borrowed? Will countries continue to want Belt and Road investment now that they've seen what other countries' experiences have been, will China have to sort of change the terms under which it's offering some of these um, investments? So yeah, I mean, I think that there are um, there are a lot of questions that are still we're still figuring out the answers about what the implications of this program are. But it certainly is like a massive global infrastructure construction project that has been transformative in ways that are probably good in some places and not so good in others. Um, yeah? What is China's internal position on its own population? Is it looking to grow it or have it remain static? Yeah, so after decades of a one-child policy um, in which you know, people who had an illegal second child were fined, were forced to have abortions, had their houses knocked down, 
Um, now the Chinese government is very actively encouraging people to have babies um, because, as someone mentioned before, they're on the they're facing this dramatic population decline. So their population is going to begin to rapidly age. Um, that has major economic implications in a variety of ways, right? They are going to run out of a working age population to support those aging people. Um, because of the one-child dynamics, there's tremendous pressure on people, um, essentially, of my generation who are, you know, one child supporting two parents at a time when many young people um, really have limited income and the job opportunities are limited, housing is very expensive. So all of China's economic uh, um, challenges can sort of come together. So yeah, there was this interesting, initially they, they, relax, they sort of selectively relaxed the one-child policy um, and said people can have two uh, in some places and then they could have two in more places and then they can have three and like no one's having babies anyway, right? So the policy change uh, did not actually affect people's behavior to nearly the degree that I think policymakers wanted it to. And part of it goes back sort of to the question of cultural change mm -hmm. is that, you know, when you encourage people to only have one child and, and strongly sort of give them that message that that is the right thing to do for you know decades, then people learn that message. But probably a more important factor is the same reasons why birth rates are really low across a lot of the advanced industrial economies. No one's having babies in Taiwan or Japan or South Korea either, or Italy, or you know, birth rate is lower here. And part of it is that you know, children are expensive, housing is expensive, um, people's work pressures are really high. Uh, you know, people feel like they don't have enough childcare support, like all the same reasons why people in other places are not having babies are a big part of the reason why, you know, 30 year olds in Shanghai are not having babies either. Um, and so those are really fundamental problems that I think the government will try to find ways to solve. But thus far, it's not clear. Um, this is something that basically all the East Asian countries are worried about. And a, a lot of countries have tried different policy solutions of, you know, subsidizing child care, giving people incentives in various ways, and it's not clear that those incentive policies really have worked. Yeah? Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. I, I found it very illuminating, and it felt to me unbiased, but I'm no expert. <laughs> and so my question is, if, if you were hypothetically to give the same talk in China, would they look at it differently? Would they, would they say your view of the history is different than theirs, or yeah. the view of the current situation is different than theirs? So I think that, um, I, I think my, my experience of meeting with Chinese officials in the last couple of years has been that they are very, very quick to blame all of these problems on the US. And so I think that that is the, the place where they would disagree with my story, right? So, um, uh, you know, I think that they would sort of generally share the idea that there was a long period of engagement, that I think they mostly look back on positively and would like to return to. Um, you know, that's a little bit divided. My sense is that right now there are some parts of the Chinese government that are very eager to foster engagement again. Um, and, you know, Chuck Schumer going and like sitting with the Shanghai Party Secretary <coughs> Um, you know, that, that's something that some parts of the Chinese government really want. Uh, others, I think, are not so sure. They're not, um, they're not sure that engagement with the U.S. is good for China, much in the same way that, you know, many leaders here are not sure engagement with China is good for the U.S. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they would say, for instance, that the Hong Kong protests were caused by outside agitators, um, you know, who were trying to foment unrest on China's territory. And you know, you can show them all the photos you want of 20% of the Hong Kong population showing up at these massive, you know, million person protests in a city of seven million people. Um, but somehow every single one of those people, you know, they claim was paid by the CIA, right? So there's a narrative for any problem in China, there's a narrative about how it was the fault of the US. Um, and I think that there's even, even when officials are talking to audiences that might be reasonably sympathetic to them, I think there's a, a real quickness right now to blame the US for China's internal problems, its external problems, everything. Um, 
So yeah, um, I, 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 it's a great question. Um, they would definitely tell me that Taiwan is a, a province of China, and, and you know that Taiwan has always been part of China. So yeah, that's another place where we might disagree. Yeah. I, I'd sort of like to follow up on on that point. Um, as an outsider who knows practically nothing about China, hasn't studied it, it sounds to me with their surveillance and their facial recognition and their, that, let me use the term brainwashing, that, that rational, intelligent people could look at a, a picture of millions of, of thousands and thousands of people in the street of Hong Kong and say, they're all outside agitators. Um, that kind of brainwash, to me, I have a feeling I wouldn't want to live in China for all the money in the world. I, I, it scares the living shit out of me that, that my perception of it, which may be wrong, but to me it sounds like an Orwellian nightmare in terms of the freedom to think, mm. um, the freedom to express ideas. And just recently I've been following the Israeli Hamas and there was a couple of instances where at the University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard, wealthy Jewish and influential Jewish donors came down hard on the administrations for not criticizing uh, Israel, uh, uh, Hamas enough. And that's just a tiny tip. Fortunately, that's a, they're still outliers. That's not going on everywhere. But that, kind of scariness in China, that's ridiculous. You, so, at, at least it's not yourself. Yeah, I mean, so Is let me... Is like, like, it an I, I don't think it's an Orwellian nightmare. So, you know, I think one of the things that is really important to understand about China is that it, it you know, it's a lot of people, it's a lot of people to rule through fear and force, right? And so the Chinese government has a real repressive mechanism and if you challenge the regime you will absolutely feel the weight of that repressive mechanism right and that was always true but i think it has become vastly more true in the last 10 years that said i think their primary tool for maintaining power is that they have kind of made a bargain with citizens an informal bargain that life will get better um, in economic terms in sort of day-to-day -day quality of life terms uh, life will get better year on year for citizens as long as they don't challenge the regime. And so most people, I think, actually are reasonably satisfied with sort of staying away from politics. Well, what about intellectuals like us with the value of free yeah. thought yeah. is like critical to yeah. the whole being? So, you know, it used to be the case that um, you would like have a conversation with someone in China and they would shut their office door and then they would tell you about how much they hate the Communist Party and you know tell you like really what they think or cab drivers you know you could have quite honest conversations with a cab driver if you could speak Chinese um, where they tell you all about like what was wrong with China and um, you know I think that the room for that has really shrunk but you know, there, there, people find ways to live in a lot of systems, and so I think a lot of people, you know, they don't care too much about politics. They're happy to, you know, kind of ignore politics, and you know, their family has like a, a an air conditioner which they didn't have ten years ago, and they have a car which they didn't have ten years ago, and those kinds of material improvements to life, like that's not nothing in a country that was really, really poor. Um, you know, even even in like the year 2000, this was a very poor country, right? So the, the progress that China has made in terms of just providing for the da daily life of its citizens and sort of gradual improvements, I, I think it's important not to underestimate the importance of that to a lot of people. But I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you that it is, it's very difficult for lots of people to, to live in a society where they can't express themselves freely. I don't think people are brainwashed. I think a lot of people know that there's a lot they don't know. Um, and, you know, in some cases, they find ways to access foreign websites, for instance, to find out about the information that the Chinese government is censoring. 
Um, you know, not everyone, and certainly it's sort of limited, or, or disproportionately it's educated people who are using those kinds of techniques. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think, I guess I would say, like, I think, I don't think that we should underestimate the kind of, um, the autonomy or the, the ability of people in China to see what's going on, because I think a lot of people see what's going well, just on. Just one quick follow-up to that. If, if you, you said before, I don't know how many years ago, people would close the office door and tell you the truth. Why isn't that, what, what's changed about people? Have they all been bought off by air conditioners? They, they don't no, think I mean, anymore? I think, or I think the regime has gotten more repressive, you know? So, um, uh, so you know, universities, I think, had often, I mean, they were, they were monitored by the regime, but there were a fair number of, like, liberals who would be quietly critical of the regime. Um, and in recent years, a number of those people have lost their jobs. Um, in, it's particularly sad in, in Xinjiang, there were a number of Uyghur professors who were quite prominent and then wound up being jailed or sent to re-education camps. Um, you know, professors now have, there have been a number of examples of professors being sort of reported on by their students for saying something that was critical of Xi Jinping. And, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's not, it's authoritarian, it's not totalitarian. So, you know, it's a place where in terms of daily life, people have a lot of autonomy. But in terms of politics and freedom of expression, certainly people are kind of, are, are very constrained. Thank yeah? You. Who's the better spy? Us or them? <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I have no basis to answer that question. I wish I knew. It's a great question. We have time for about one more one question. question. Um, yeah? Can you comment on Putin's visit to China? Good. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's been clear, I guess, since um, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine that I, I think at the beginning, um, my uh, my sense is that China was caught by surprise um, and was probably Chinese leaders were pretty mad, um, but that since then. China has kind of converged in a position that it's going to provide some support to Russia and, you know, Putin and see, see each other as, you know, sort of allies or partners in crime in some literal way, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have that much to say about the specifics of the visit other than that I think it completely makes sense with the ways in which they were talking about their relationship. Um, and you know the kind of various forms of support that China seems to be providing to Russia, um, and obviously there's not too many places right now where you know Putin would get an invitation to go. And so I think you know this was like this coming to a multilateral forum in this way. It's something that only China was able to provide. I think China feels like having Russia dependent on it for its status is good for China. Like it increases China's leverage in the world, um, and so. You know, even if Putin is not a trustworthy ally, I think China feels like it gets to be now the senior partner in the relationship, and like that's beneficial to, to the Chinese government. Over here. Yes. Uh, uh, just to lighten it up a little bit, uh, a factoid that we might all want to know as Vermonters is that the enormous uh, memorial to Chiang Kai-shek in uh, Taiwan is a white Vermont marble. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And, and the, the second uh, the second part, which may disturb some people here, last year China produced more coal than they ever did before in history, and they imported more coal than Australia. they ever did before in history. So uh, when you hear about what they're doing for global warming, uh, they're exacerbating it. That is a fantastic uh, little factoid to end on. I think we need to give our presenter a bit of a break.